Lord, heal our body, mind, and soul. Dear brothers and sisters, every one of us has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But by the free gift of God's grace, all of us have been realigned and rearranged to stand alongside God. And this arrangement for us to become righteous can only be done when we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. The text we are dealing with has to do with sin. And the text, the passage we have just read comes from Paul's deep belief in Christian life arising from Paul's own experience and written in order to help Christians know how deep God loves them and how much they have to do to be able to catch up and be seen as acceptable in the presence of God. The key verse in other translations reads, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That shows that we are all in need of forgiveness. And we know that sin is like a sickness. And from the reading that we had from the Gospel of Matthew, we notice there something that has given us the thing. We are asking God to heal us body, mind, and soul. Our Lord Jesus healed the sick and gave them new hopes to those who were hopeless. Jesus was concerned and had special pity on children, women, and men who were oppressed, who were sad, and who were discriminated against. Jesus has given us that command also to heal, but it all depends on our own energy to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and to acknowledge that we have gifts. We know how much sickness is involved in our lives. If we examine each person, we will notice that why we rejoice when we are eating, why we are glad when we are beautiful, why we are happy when we can enjoy the weather, we become sad when we are sick. <coughs> when sickness strikes, we are broken. The common understanding in the Old Testament was that when someone was sick, it was because they had committed a sin and therefore they needed to be healed 
from their sin. Okay. Searching it was not only in the Old Testament, but even today among us, and particularly with our African background, when someone is very seriously ill, we either accuse that person of having committed a sin, or we accuse the neighbors or relatives for bewitching the person. This means that sickness in itself has to do with relationship between the individual and the community, and especially with God. That is why we can see that in the story we read from Matthew, someone was paralyzed. That is physical sickness. And when Jesus came along, Jesus had compassion on that person. In fact, from that story, you can deduce something very special about the healing message and the healing methods of Jesus. This is somebody who is lying there hopeless, not able to move. This is somebody brought in on a stretcher by the friends. And when they bring the person to Jesus, Jesus pronounces, your sins are forgiven. There, there was reaction to that. First, the crowd, those who thought they were nearer the commandments of God, who thought they knew God very well. And of course, we know the class of people Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees. They accused Jesus of blasphemy. How dare he forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. You could dwell on this text and take it from that anger and see that here they were questioning the authority of Jesus. But Jesus did not stay with them. But Jesus went ahead to demonstrate another act of healing, another aspect of healing. Jesus said, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, stand up, take your mat and go home? And he repeated that, take your mat and go home. Now, from here you see that the, in the, the first time, the story says the person was physically sick. Jesus healed the person by, forgive, by pronouncing forgiveness of sins. The second time, the argument is about authority. And Jesus demonstrates the authority by healing the person physically. So you see that the person was sick physically. That was the body. But the people, as Jesus, the story tells us, the people who were questioning Jesus' authority were sick in the mind because they concentrated their thinking on the authority of Jesus rather than on the compassion on the sick person. So they didn't care if the person was cured. Rather, they were concerned on, on combating Jesus. So they were sick in mind. Now, when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. That was dealing with the soul, the spirit of the person. It had to do with the person's spiritual standing. It had to do with the person's relationship to God. And you can, you understand. Those we describe sometimes, we see people 
and we say they are disabled. Because we think that the normal thing is for somebody to be balanced, to be beautiful, to be handsome, to be straight. And we have set our standards. So if nobody, if the person does not measure up to our standard, we say the person is disabled. And so from that angle, you could see that a person who is in a condition that others do not appreciate get withdrawn in themselves. They are not able to come out to meet with people and they carry a grudge all the time because they feel society has isolated them and denied them the possibility of living. You know this from people you, are, you, you might have had who are physically, so-called physically handicapped. They are always looking as if they are angry with everybody. Whatever you do, they just behave as if they don't appreciate anything that is done to them. And they want to draw the whole world to them. So they carry anger in their mind. And because of anger, they are not able to live free. And that is the reason Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Because unless you clear your mind, unless you get rid of anger, unless you get rid of, of grudge, even if you are physically sick, you may not get well. Even if you have a boy on you and it is being treated and you are grudging somebody for being the cause of you having that boy, even if bumps are applied, you don't get healed because God has so made it that our body is united with, to our brain, to our mind, the way we function our functioning in relation to God, our functioning in relation to thinking about other people, our functioning physically in moving about. So Jesus' methods of healing were to heal the, the first the spirit and then to clear the mind of any grudges before physical healing. You will see that in some cases, Jesus taught the ground, taught the eye of a blind person, and the eye opened. And when the eye opened, it was not Jesus was not concerned with just the physical seeing of the person, but Jesus was concerned that that person should be able to see God and to see that the power of healing came from God. So my friends, the text of Romans is dealing with sin and particularly the sin that is inching on, on anger. And so you will see that it relates to the reading of the, from the Psalm. Psalm 103 is a Psalm that we prescribe for healing prayers. When you have a healing, a healing prayers, you celebrate Psalm 103. And Psalm 103 describes God and show who God is in relation to us. And that is order for us to carry on to, to be able to pick up those characteristics of God. The Psalm helps us to pray when we are tired. When you are tired, turn to Psalm 103. When you are frustrated, turn to Psalm 103. When you are in need of consolation, turn to Psalm 103. It's one of those Psalms that are are selected for healing prayers. We are guided to praise God for all kinds of good deeds. God forgives all our sins. God heals all our diseases. God redeems us when we are at the verge of dying. We are at the verge of dying. God redeems us, can take you out of the mouth of a lion. God can take you away from a snake bite. God can take you 
away even from an, a, 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 a nest of bees. God crowns us with love and kindness. Even when we disobey God and break the laws that the, uh, God has given. Remember last week, we we're dealing with the laws of God. God is still kind to us, even when we disobey God. God satisfies all our desires and necessities. Remember that we have certain human basic needs. Of course, we pay for them, some of them, but generally they are natural. If you take the air that we breathe, if you take the water that we, we, we drink, you take the food that we eat, these are basic necessities that God has made available for us to maintain the body so that the body can be physically uh, strong. And see how much we spend on medicine when the body is broken. But then God still provides and helps us to acquire those things that can satisfy our needs. We don't need to be luxurious in our living, but we just need the basic necessities that can sustain life. And this God provides for us. God intervenes when we suffer injustice. There are cases that sometimes people are going to court for cases that they have not committed, for charges, wrong charges. And when they are there, it's a, sometimes people, are, everybody knows that this person is going to go to prison, but they are surprised that the case turns around and the person is liberated. Of course, the, the other side will still be angry because they think they are cheated, but it's a mystery and it's God's way of righting wrong. I mean, when something is going wrong. So God can intervene in cases of injustice, especially in the case of widows, in the case of orphans who don't have somebody to stand by them, as it was in the Old Testament, and as we heard in the story of the widow of Nain, that, I mean, she was crying because she had, she, her son had died and she knew had nobody to protect her. God will provide someone to stand in for us. God can stand in for us in the case of bias, because we live with people who just get bias against us, either because we are we, we come from the African ethnic group, either because we come from a family that I mean is not so popular, either because we are black, and people just get bias against us. God can stand in the case of prejudice. There are people who are just prejudiced. And they will say, because you come from a particular ethnic group, from a particular tribe, I mean, the people don't uh, uh, want to associate with you. Or they just disown, they don't refuse to share food with you because they say, oh, this type of food is eaten only by these people. I cannot eat it. God forbids outright discrimination. And that's why if the Bible is full of instructions that we should welcome foreigners, to accommodate them. Even the servants at home should not be dis uh, discriminated against. God is never partial. God is impartial. That means God does not take sides as we sometimes we do. And so these things which we celebrate all come from the fact that God is love. And because God is love, God's love is inclusive of everyone. These are the things that here, and they are celebrated in this psalm to show us that we too ought to be the same. So with Christian eyes and Christian minds, we can realize that we receive blessings from God and all the blessings that we have are by grace. We don't deserve them, but because of God's special love for us, God extends these blessings to us. If today we face hurt, if today we face hate, remember to count your blessings and remember to thank God for intervening in your life. If I open up 
for everyone to tell the story of what experience they have had of healing. I mean, sometimes when you hear of healing, we are only thinking of physical healing. But as I have said, there are, if you open your mind, you will see that you need to be healed of anger. You need to be healed of prejudice. You need to be healed of grudge. You need to be healed of bias. You need to be healed of injustice. You need to be healed of discrimination. You need to be healed of corruption. You need to be healed of outright I mean, the, the corruption, dealing with people in a way that you always want to have something in return for every little bit of favor that you give to people. So sickness of the spirit is caused by personal guilt. Sometimes we are sick in the spirit. And when we are, uh, you, you, you have a guilt of something that you did not do in the past, and it comes on and on. It disturbs your spirit. And even while we are sitting here in church, your mind is somewhere else. You are thinking of something else. Emotional sickness. Sometimes we just have anxiety. And anxiety can be because we want a particular thing and we are not getting it. We develop anxiety about it. It can lead to depression. We can get depressed because of some thing that has happened in our life. And we think that we have been left on our own and we get depressed or if you are, you, you are, you are isolated, you are far away from home. You are in, in living in conditions that are not conducive to you. You can get depressed. Sometimes something that had happened in the past, somebody heard you somebody insulted you, somebody called you names. When you remember that, each time you see that person, you remember that they come back to you and then you, you feel you really get emotional. And that, that is even more painful than physical sickness. Physical sickness may be caused by actual disease or something that comes by accident. When you have an accident, you can enjoy yourself. You can have a broken arm, or like, like when my wife had to leave for, for months because she had an injury. So you see, when these things uh, uh, come, you can actually look at them and then you can see that some of them, uh, the, the, some of them are mixed. There is a physical sickness, there is mental sickness, and there's spiritual sickness. There is also demonic attack. Sometimes the, 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 the demons can attack you. And you, I mean, that uh, some cases that have gone to the hospital, they are not able to diagnose them. You have to, have to find out, but uh, there are evil spirits that can attack you and even deform you. But there are, the way to, uh, to tackle this, as uh, Jesus' uh, method of healing uh, taught us, we need to sometimes to pray. We need to ask God to show us the way to handle those things. And we need, of course, to take our medications because medicines are made by God and even doctors are appointed by God. We need physical healing in person if our condition is caused by disease or by accident. For demonic possession, when we are possessed by evil spirits, we can only heal that by prayer, by exorcism. That is praying that God should get rid of those bad spirits that are in you. Like we have seen in some cases when Jesus came and they brought somebody who was possessed, Jesus had to carry out exorcism and cast out the demons from, from that person. We do that by prayer, by the laying on of hands, and even by anointing with oil. My dear friends, you can see that even uh, sometimes we are complaining about some sickness, but we know what might be causing that sickness. There are some times that we go to the hospital and they, 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 are, they are not able to find out what actually is happening with your blood pressure or with something that is internal. 
But when when they say go home and sort it out, and you come home, you need to sit down and examine your relationships. For example, a married person may ask for prayers because they are not able to relate to their spouse, and they are concerned about the the thing that the problem is from the from the partner. But when you, they examine you, examine yourself, you will notice that. It may be something that had happened to that person. Maybe that that person had gone to a spiritist, and the spiritist had given a formula, and they did not fulfill that formula, and that 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 caused them uh, uh, some, some dis disturbance. But so it will not be the question of the partner may not may, may not be the issue. So we need to examine exactly what would have something that you have done because as we move around, friends deceive us and they say, "Oh, yeah, you can, you are no, you don't have children. Let me take you to somebody who can do, do something uh, and then help you to have a child." And then they we go there and receive instructions that can 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 disturb our spiritual balance. And we are sitting in church, and but then our power, where our source of power is elsewhere. These things, my dear friends, haunt us, haunt our spirit, and there are times that the spirit of the dead is hanging over our head. And we, we carry about, we are thinking of someone who had died, and maybe we had committed something against that person. And when we keep remembering that I wish I had done this, that troubles us. So these are things that Jesus, when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, it means you need to examine your life, confess these things, and then you can get you can get rid of them. So the key point here that the text we read from Romans is dealing with is that Jesus Christ is the center of life. But I'm looking at it from the point that it's not just calling the name of Jesus, but it is knowing what Jesus is capable of doing and as a Christian aligning ourselves with Jesus and knowing that we are disciples of Jesus we should follow the footsteps of Jesus and see how even as the son of God Jesus did not do anything without prayer see how even as the person who had all authority Jesus still called two or three disciples to accompany him when he was going to, to heal somebody See how Jesus spoke to people and, and, and had a relation with people, even in the crowd. A woman touches Jesus' garment and Jesus notices it and deals with that. So Jesus tells us that why we may have all kinds of superior power, but we cannot notice the power that we have until we come in contact with persons who don't have that power. So that woman taught us a lesson by touching Jesus' garment, it showed us that Jesus was, uh, was a holy person. Jesus was an all-round person. And therefore, our belief in Jesus is not, it's not misplaced. It's a belief in a person who can stand in for us. And we believe that Jesus is sitting at the right-hand side of God, by the side of God, interceding for us. And so whenever we are in trouble, we call in the name of Jesus. And when we call the name of Jesus, we know that Jesus is present because that's what Jesus said, that he will be with us from till the end of the, of, the, of the world. So healing, like sickness, is a composite affair. It grows so many things. So you cannot take one method of healing. That is why even when we have patients in the hospital, we still need to visit that person with food. We still need to visit that person with songs. We still need to visit that person with prayer. And that the comfort, the, 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 the company that we give a sick person heals faster than just isolating the person, giving medicine. That's why this uh, coronavirus thing is very devastating because it denies the company that people ought to have. And that's why it is more painful than other sicknesses. And it is for us then, to pray that God, who is the God of nature, God, the creator of heaven and earth, should bring this thing to an end.
so that we can celebrate our togetherness with zeal and with faith. We must accept and understand that God works for us. God stands for us. God works for us through Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, whatever you are suffering from can be lifted up. In the name of Jesus, take to heart that whatever pain you are having right now can be taken away. Pray in earnest. Commit your life to Jesus Christ. Accept the power of the Holy Spirit and stand before the cross. Look at the cross and know that on that cross, Jesus Christ took our pain, our suffering, our sin. He was crucified on our behalf and therefore he is ready to die for us over and over by taking away our pain and giving us the grace, showing us mercy and blessing us all the days. May God grant you healing. By just the word of God, you are healed. Amen. Amen.